Oops, what happened to this one? Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Okay, so are there any questions before we start today? No? Remember that you need to uh, make sure and do the homework. Um, which is actually there's two homeworks. There's chapter three and chapter four and so um, You want to make sure that you complete both of those by midnight on Sunday. Okay. Yeah, Sunday midnight. So all the so the homeworks are always due Sunday at midnight. Okay. Yes um, I'm, I'm, We're gonna see how far we get today and then I'll find out whether I need to do an online lecture or not. Okay, so we were talking about organic molecules, and I believe we got to proteins, is that right? Correct. Okay, so we were talking about how proteins have this three-dimensional structure, which determines their shape. And uh, uh, the enzyme that we used in the lab this week was an example of a protein. And so that three-dimensional structure of sucrase um, allows it to bind to sucrose and then break the covalent bonds between the two monosaccharides. So you had that chemical reaction and it's in your lab notebook, um, but it's on the lab um, handout, right? And so what happened when you heated the um, enzyme up? Did it work better or did it not work so well? Does anybody remember? It didn't work as well, right? And so that kind of goes against what is in your textbook, which says that enzyme works better at, at, at a higher temperature, right? But it also did not take into consideration that boiling is too hot. So remember how we talked about how one of the requirements of life is, is that we maintain a relatively constant temperature, right? And so if we get hyperthermia, so we get too hot, if we have like a too high of a fever, then the proteins can start to denature. And so what was denaturation? The unfolding, right? So if this is my uh, protein, my enzyme, when it denatures, it goes back to the primary protein structure, which is, which is just a chain of amino acids, which doesn't do anything, right? So even if you took that 100 degrees and you and you cooled it down to body temperature, it still would not work because once we denature the proteins, it's permanent denature. Okay, so what about when we freeze them? What do you think? Less active. Um, it's also important to realize that enzymes are not alive. So you can't kill an enzyme, you can denature it. Enzymes are not living, they are just molecules, right? They're produced by living things, but they're not themselves living. So when you freeze an, uh, an enzyme, and oftentimes when the enzymes come, like if I get enzymes um, to um, use in lab, it actually, actually asks me to store it by freezing them, because they actually stay um, good longer. But when you heat them back up, they still work. So generally, freezing does not tend to denature the enzymes. Um, it just slows down the chemical reaction so that it doesn't occur very um, uh, or very, uh, the enzyme and the substrate don't interact as much as if you have some moderate temperature. So most of you found that body temperature gave the most or the best enzyme activity, and that kind of makes sense because sucrase is in our saliva, right? And so it's a little bit warm, but not too hot, right? And so it has an optimal um, temperature at which it works, okay? How about pH? What did we find in math? Six. Right, so six is optimal, and that's a kind of saliva area, right? So um, seven, we didn't actually have a, we didn't actually use seven, but eight was too um, um, basic, and four was too acidic, okay? 
So acids can also denature. So and bases can also denature. So if you looked at like two and then you look at, at ten, you would find that there was very little enzyme activity because that that difference in change in pH causes denaturation, which is why it's so important that our blood stay a relatively constant pH, right? So that we are not um, denaturing the proteins that are in our blood and be transported in our blood. Are there any questions about that? Can you explain um, the reaction where we were talking about the, the structure of the enzyme and um, yes. the, the points that change? And so um, I don't have that image, but you'll remember that it, the, um, the um, structure of the enzyme kind of looks something like this. Actually, I mean, that's just the way they drew it, right? Right, and so what fits in here is the sucrose and the glucose, right? So this would be like my disaccharide, right? And this is my enzyme. And the enzyme is able to bind to it. There's active sites where it binds, and I kind of drew them in that shape, right? And so what the enzyme then does, it doesn't actually get used up, but it binds to this, and then it would break it into um, glucose and fructose. So whereas this was sucrose, we now say that it, it has been enzymatically um, broken down. So it's an example of enzymatic hydrolysis. We break it down. Water is added, right? And then... Um, we get the products of glucose and fructose. Okay. So what was the dependent variable in that experiment? What were we measuring? Enzyme activity, but we couldn't really, how did we measure it? We couldn't directly measure enzyme activity, but how did we measure it? That's what we altered. But what did we measure at the end of the experiment? Yes. So we looked at the, at the amount of glucose, right? And we could do that because glucose reacts with a reagent called Benedict's reagent, right, to produce an orange solid. So we would say that the amount of glucose was dependent, the amount of glucose produced was dependent upon the temperature and the pH. So the temperature and the pH are what we altered, so those would be the independent variables. So hopefully you will start to... Um, when you uh, look at um, experimental designs, you'll start to ask yourself, what is the independent variable, what's the dependent variable, and what are the control variables? Okay. Any other questions about that? Okay, so the last group of um, organic molecules that we need to uh, look at are what are referred to as nucleic acids. So then can anybody give you an example of a nucleic acid? What is our genetic material composed of? DNA, right? Okay. So this is short for deoxyribonucleic acid. All right? So DNA. Right, the oxyribonucleic acid. So when you look at what nucleic acids are made up of, they are made of nucleotides. So the monomer of a nucleic acid is a nucleotide. And a nucleotide has three components to it. It has a nitrogenous base And that means that there's nitrogen in it. It actually has an amine group. Remember, we talked about organic molecules and the, and the functional groups that were attached to them. It has a nitrogenous base. It has a ribose sugar. And it has a phosphate group. Okay. So the nitrogenous bases are the letters that are sometimes used to designate our genetic material. 
So these nitrogenous bases, um, we're not going to talk about them. Um, I'm not going to give you the names yet, but they are A, T, C, and G. So those are just the letters that are used to designate the nitrogenous bases. Okay. So in your book, there's a diagram that shows a um, nucleotide, right? And so the sugar here is a ribose sugar. It has four carbons. One, two, three, four. It's actually a five. Um, it's, a, it's five rings. There's actually a carbon. So anyway, that's ribose. And then this is my phosphate group. And then this is my nit nitrogenous base. And remember that the nitrogenous base in this particular instance has nitrogen in the rings and it also has an amine group, okay? So these nitrogenous bases are what differ. So they could be the A, the G, the T, and the C. So in our genetic material, our DNA, part of it is made of sugar and part of it is a phosphate and the other part are the bases, okay? Another molecule that's really important in... Um, our bodies that is an, another example of a nucleic acid is ATP. So ATP is a real simple nucleic acid that just has one nucleotide, one nitrogenous base, which is adenine. So this is adeno or adenine triphosphate, adenosine, sorry, adenosine triphosphate. Right? So there's, in this particular instance, there's a nitrogenous base, the adenine, and then we have three phosphate groups. So they're generally written kind of like this with a P. Right? So that's triphosphate. This last bond right here is a very high energy bond. And so when you break that, you release energy that can then be used to power cellular, cellular functions, okay? So oftentimes it's written, this chemical reaction that takes place as ATP, and this chemical reaction can occur in two directions, ADP plus P plus energy, okay? So AD just means that it's adenosine diphosphate, and you release one of the phosphates. So this is the third phosphate, and this is an exergonic reaction because it releases energy, right? So I can say in this direction is releasing energy. So this is exergonic. Okay, and then we could talk about endogonic or endergonic. Um, is that how you spell it? Mm. Let's see. I might have to look that one up. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so we can actually store energy. Endergonic. Sorry, it's endergonic. Okay, going the other way. So we can, ATP kind of goes back and forth. Right? So it can be used to store energy, and it can be used to release energy so that the cell can do other things. And we're going to talk about the chemical reactions in, the, in I think, uh, later. We'll talk about it before cell reproduction when we talk about metabolism. Okay? So this would be, which one's catabolism? The exergonic or the endergonic? Exergonic. Exergonic, right? So we're breaking it apart. So anabolic reaction would be building. So it would be the endergonic. So this is catabolism. So using some of the other words that we've had in lecture, and this would be anabolism, right? Building a molecule. Okay. So if we look at that, um, okay. So this is adenosine triphosphate. Triphosphate, so we have the adenine group, we have the ribose group, and then we have the three phosphate groups. Okay, so that's the structure of ATP. Okay, so this is actually a picture of our DNA molecule, and we're gonna go into detail about 
like how does the DNA molecule code for proteins? We're going to talk about how the DNA molecule makes a copy of itself. Um, but I just wanted to show you this. That the DNA molecule is double-stranded, and these are the bases, and they pair in a particular order. So notice that A pairs with T and G pairs with C. And one of the reasons I wanted to show you this is just that there's a special type of bond between the two strands of DNA. And what type of bond is that? What, yes. So that is a hydrogen bond, right? It is weak, right? We can actually heat DNA up and we can break that bond and get single-stranded DNA, right? And there are enzymes that are able to really easily break that chemical bond and then use one side of the DNA molecule as a template to build another strand. This side can also be used as a template to build another strand. And so I think it's really interesting that our DNA has in it some weak bonds that actually must be broken in order for the DNA to make copies of itself prior to making a copy of like a whole cell, right? Passing it on um, during cell reproduction. Okay. So those were the nucleic acids. So I'm going to hand out two handouts here. And the first one has to do with a very complex organic substance, which is milk, um, raw, whole breast milk. And then uh, there's also a comparison with that and um, cow's milk formula. And then I have um, a sheet with some questions about that information. I'm not counting them. Okay, so there should be two different handouts. We just want to pay attention to the handouts that talk about right now, the sides of the handouts that talk about the organic molecules. And then we're going to talk about the cells in later on in the lecture. Okay, so let's look at the breast milk side. And um, you'll notice that it contains lots of interesting things that help in the nutrition. We talked about last um, week how newborns, right, utilize milk as their substance for nutrition, right? And then as most mammals grow and when they become weaned, they stop producing the enzyme that breaks down lactose. And so they become what is referred to as lactose intolerant. So that is what is normally found. And you remember, what type of molecule is lactose? It's a sugar, which is also called a carbohydrate, right? So it's actually a, uh, it's a disaccharide. So right here on this sheet of paper, you can look over here and you can say, okay, lactose would be B. So I would match it with B because lactose is a carbohydrate. So these other things are also found in milk, right? And so what I'd like you to do, they have them listed over here, but I'd like you to um, put whether or not cholesterol, what kind of molecule cholesterol is, antibodies, enzymes, triglycerides, etc. So just go down there and see if you can find them on the breast milk side of the page and then figure out what type of macromolecule they are. So this shouldn't take very long, but you can help each other if you'd like.
Okay, so cholesterol, what people put. Cholesterol is what type of organic molecule? Lipid, right? So it should be A. We, uh, lactose should be B. How about antibodies? C, right? So antibodies have an immune function. We talked a little bit about that. So colostrum is the first milk that has that is high in antibodies. So antibodies help protect the newborn from infection. What about lipase? What do they have it listed under? Lipase is also a protein. So it would be broken down if you heat it. So when you pasteurize milk, like if this was cow's milk and you pasteurized it, you would you would denature a lot of the um, the anti excuse me a lot of the antibodies and also the enzymes so that it wouldn't have functioning enzymes in it. <coughs> what about triglycerides? Those are lipids, and so that would be animal fat, right? So that's specifically fat. So is that saturated or unsaturated? Saturated, right? So it has lots of uh, hydrogen um, in it, and that means that the molecules can stack really tightly and become a solid. Casein, protein. So if you've ever made cheese curds or eaten cheese curds, you know that if you like take milk and you acidify it by putting lemon juice in it, you can actually make buttermilk, right? So it'll become um, curdled, and uh, curdled means just that the um, the uh, um, acidity of the milk has been lowered and the proteins in nature. So buttermilk is more acidic than regular milk. How about lactoferrin? Protein. Ferrin, what do you think ferrin is a mineral or refers to a mineral? It would be what? Iron, right? So lactoferrin is a molecule that transports iron and iron is a necessary nutrient because it's used to build hemoglobin, right? And then the long chain fatty acids would be lipids, right? So if you um, look at the difference between breast milk and cow's milk, you notice that there's a cow's milk formula. You'll notice that there are a lot of things that are in breast milk that are beneficial that are not found in cow's milk. So this is why the medical profession has, is promoting breast is best, especially um, like for the first six months because it um, helps um, develop the um, newborn, there's hormones and other wonderful stuff in there. And there's also long chain fatty acids that actually aid in the development of the nervous system. But if you look down below, one of the things that um, breast milk does have in it, and also cow's milk, but not cow's milk formula, is what are referred to as persistent organic pollutants. And so these are sometimes abbreviated as the POPs, P-O-P-S. And I've given you a little bit of information about persistent organic pollutants from a journal article. And these are specifically synthetic chemicals. So they're not found in nature. So they're man-made, right? And generally, they uh, could be things that are added to um, substances. Um, so a good example of this would be BPA. And what does B, what has BPA been added to? Does anybody know? Plastic. So you can buy plastic bottles that are BPA free, right? And so BPA is an example of a persistent organic pollutant. And one of the problems with these pollutants is that they um, persist in the body because they cannot be easily excreted using the urinary system. So BPA is one example. We also have DDT. So this is an insecticide that is sprayed to fight off mosquitoes, right? We also have things like um, PCB. This is industrial waste. And then we have um, PBDE. <laughs> so these are just abbreviations for the real long names, organic chemistry. 
uh, organic chemists love. So this would be a flame retardant. This can be found in some older furniture and carpets and actually was um, used in children's sleepwear for a sh short period of time. Let me turn the lights down a little bit. And then we have, last one is dioxin. And you might have heard of dioxin because this is controversial, controversial because this is a byproduct of chlorine bleach. So byproduct of bleaching of the bleaching process. And so there was some concern that females were using things like tampons that have dioxin in them because the tampons are bleached material, right? And also um, pads near the reproductive areas, okay? <laughs> so when we look at these, they're synthetic. They are not easily eliminated from the body. And so they're stored in fat. So females have generally lots of fat in their breast tissue. And so they can also be um, gotten rid of via the breast milk. So they can be... Um, found in breast milk. So this isn't something that we generally talk about in this country, but in other countries, it's been very controversial, and they actually have what are called breast milk monitoring programs, where females can take samples of their breast milk and like send it into a lab, and they get it back and see what's going on. And they've actually also um, looked at it over time um, and found that if you clean up the environment, oftentimes um, you can um, clean up the breast milk supply. So let me look at my back of my topics. Oops, where did it go? Oh, I don't have that image here, sorry. Oh, I wanted to show you something. I'll have to show it to you later. Okay, so if we go back to my whiteboard here. Okay, the other thing that's really interesting about um, uh, these persistent organic pollutants is is that they um, become more concentrated the higher you move up the food chain. So even in Eastern Oregon, for example, there are persistent organic pollutants in the sediments of the Columbia River. The, that gets put into, that gets incorporated into algae, then it gets incorporated into small um, crustaceans and small insects that live in the water. And then it will move up and it will become actually more concentrated in the fish. And so fish, in coming from this, coming from particular regions, including the Columbia River, will have high levels of persistent organic pollutants. And it was really interesting because the tribe did a study of this, and they actually tested themselves, and they found out that yes, they do have relatively high levels of these persistent organic pollutants in their fish, and also in themselves. But their conclusion from the study was that it was too important for their tribal autonomy and their culture to keep eating this type of food, um, it was more important to eat the food, uh, at least in small quantities, than it was to completely eliminate from, it from their diets, like stopping the salmon entirely, right? So I'm going to show you this little video that was published by the United Nations that talks about these pollutants. It's only a five-minute video, and it talks about some of the um, concerns of them, and then I'll also see if I can find my image. Oh, we're at it. Oh, come on. Some of the world's worst toxic pollutants are traveling the globe, largely unseen, and are in tiny amounts. 
In the 1920s, the process of electrifying the world triggered cheap inert insulation. Polychlorinated biphenols, or PCBs, were hailed as a universal answer. Decades later, their toxic risks were discovered, but not before millions of tons were installed in electrical equipment all over the globe. It was in Sweden that the PCB problem was discovered. It was in 1966, and then it could be understood what has happened in the wildlife in that period. That the seeds would have proceeded if you hadn't taken care of the PCB oils from an oil transformator capacitate, or just put it on the sewage or try to burn it or something like that, they have been diffusely spread into the environment. And that was happening all over the world. Found to be toxic and carcinogenic and leaking from aging transformers, PCBs were ending up in seas like the Baltic, where they were absorbed by plankton. Because they don't readily break down, PCBs get passed into fish that eat the plankton. Bigger fish then eat the smaller ones and so on up the food chain until the fish are eaten by humans. The wives of Swedish fishermen were passing PCBs to their children before they were born and through breast milk afterwards. The mainstay of their diet, fish from the Baltic. We saw the effects on the birds and seals, the deformed lava, we told the authorities. Said. Sweden banned PCBs in 1972 and did a thorough job of removing every possible drop from substations and other sources. But we see an effect on the birth weight, indicating that there is something going on. Researchers found, perhaps for the first time, a link between environmental cause and effect. The health damage done by PCBs is now decreasing, now that PCBs have been banned and cleaned up. Yet the Baltic still has PCBs and other POPs, often coming from far away. POPs are a global problem, requiring a global solution. Uninvited, and more than anywhere else, Pops arrive in the once pristine Arctic north of Canada to threaten the way life of the Inuit. We are um, under a threat uh, of many different kinds of pollutions that are not made by us here. We are starting to see more abnormalities of these species, seals, caribou, you know, and then parasites in, in polders and so forth. So we started to see uh, all these changes. We don't know if we're feeding pollutants as well. And if this cycle or the pollutants are going to go into our cycle, you're going to break the whole cycle of, of the earth. <laughs> More than half of all Inuit women have levels of POPs above those regarded as safe by the World Health Organization. They had something posted for contaminated meat, and I, I thought about it, but I wasn't going to start breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is still recommended as beneficial, and so too are country foods traditionally fished and hunted. The Inuit have little choice but to eat their traditional foods, the very sort that store and accumulate pots in their fatty tissues, foods like caribou, whale and seal. Nor do they want to change, it's their way of life. It's not just about contaminants in our country food, but what is connected to that and our way of life and the hunting. We are a people who have completely respected and lived in harmony with our land and with, the, with wildlife and our resources all around us. At greatest risk are children because children are rapidly growing and developing and the effects that pops can have on the body tend to affect the systems that are involved with children's development, whether it's development of their brain, the immune system, the endocrine system. 
Um, and also because your exposures are relatively great. Okay, so that talks about specifically problems um, in the Arctic where persistent organic pollutants just kind of end up in there because of the way that the air and the water patterns go up there. And so it's a global phenomenon. And so that's why they re require um, kind of a United Nations World Health Organization tactic of cleaning up different areas where it's being produced and, and trying to eliminate them. So the example that I wanted to give you was the example of the flame retardants. And this is just showing how over time um, we see that there's been a dramatic increase and then subsequent decrease. And so as soon as they stop using the flame retardants in the um, furniture, children's clothing, then they saw a decrease in the level of the chemicals in um, the breast milk. Are there any questions about that? So these are organic molecules, but they're synthetic, right? And they would be, would they, you think they would be lipid soluble or water soluble? Lipid soluble, right? So we can't get rid of them by urinating them out. And so they tend to accumulate in the fat. And so those other species like whales and like orcas that have lots of insulating fat also feel the effects of having um, large numbers of persistent organic pollutants being stored in their fat, which tends to make them very sick over time. So you'll notice here that um, there are also possible contaminants in cow's milk formula, and specifically mixing it with water, right? So you have to have a clean source of water to mix the formula with. And there's one particular inorganic pollutant which poses a great threat, and that would be nitrogen from nitrogen fertilizers. And so you might know that um, it's really important that if you drink well water, that you make sure that it's not contaminated, specifically because high levels of nitrogen in wells um, and high levels of nitrogen in the drinking water of children can cause really bad um, developmental effects on specifically on the nervous system, right? And so nitrogen, you could write down there, that nitrogen would, um, from fertilizers would be a source of inorganic contaminants, right? So even with all of the um, concern about persistent organic pollutants, um, there still is um, a lot of benefits towards breastfeeding, right? So we just need to be aware that they're present. So how many of you may have never have heard of contaminated breast milk that you didn't know that there was pollutants in breast milk, right? So it's not something that we talk about very much in the United States as compared to other countries. Okay, so we're gonna move on, leaving behind the molecules and the, and the chemistry um, for a little while. And we're gonna talk about cell biology. So it's important to realize that those molecules that we were talking about are non-living. So when we talk about characteristics of life, we say that the cell is the fundamental unit of life. So this is, right, this is the level of organization in which we see characteristics of life. So we see homeostasis. We see order, the cells have to gain nutrients, they have to get rid of waste, they have to get energy to maintain their order, and they also reproduce. Now, something is, is really interesting when we think about the history of life on this planet, because at one point in time, cells had to spontaneously arise, right? Because how else could we have cells forming on the planet? But it's important to realize that cells do not spontaneously are not spontaneously produced today right so this is kind of part of this what they call the cell theory right on the planet and so what this means is is that all cells today come from pre-existing cells
And the reason for this is, is that they believe that our atmosphere was very different when cells were first forming three billion years ago on the planet. And um, now our atmosphere has lots of oxygen in it, which is very um, disruptive, and um, so that the cells are not able to just kind of spontaneously come about. Okay. So what this means is that we can trace our cells back, right, to the very first cells that once upon a time arose on the planet. Okay. So that's the idea of the cell theory. So this is the cell theory, which is described in your book. Okay. Now, if we look at the different types of cells we have on the planet, we have um, cells that are said to be prokaryotic. So pro means before in this instance, and cary means nucleus. So these particular cells lack a nucleus. So who in here has had microbiology and can tell me what are the organisms that are made up of prokaryotic cells? What is a what is an organism that is composed of a prokaryotic cell? Bacteria. Okay. So these are the bacteria. Right. So the bacteria are very different than the cells that make up our bodies. Because our bodies are made up of a type of cell that is called a eukaryotic cell. So in this case, eu means good and carry means nucleus. So these cells have a nucleus. And the nucleus is important because this is where most of our genetic material is found. And our genetic material is in a different form than the bacteria. Bacteria, genetic, we'll talk about this, but bacteria have, have genetic material in grains, which are called plasmids. And we have um, our genetic material organized into chromosomes that are bound in the nucleus. The other thing that eukaryotic cells have is a internal membrane. that compartmentalizes the cell. And so this internal membrane um, creates what are called organelles. So organs are a much higher level of hierarchy of order than organelles. The organelles are found inside the cell. So they're small little uh, places where different chemical reactions can take place. Okay, so we'll talk about the organelles in the eukaryotic cell. Okay, so the prokaryotic cells um, arose about three billion years ago. So when we see, when we look in the fossil record, we see evidence of prokaryotic cells. This is about 1.5 billion years. So Oops, ago. So the prokaryotic cells were here first. They were around. They were the only type of life on the planet for a long period of time. And then we got the evolution of eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are much, are much bigger than the prokaryotic cells. So these are smaller. And these are bigger. Generally, um, and we're going to do this in lab, we're going to um, take a sample. Or oh, did we already do that in this class? Did you already take a sample of the cheek cells? We haven't done that in this class. Okay. So I'm so confused because I have two other classes that we're kind of talking about the same thing. So we're going to take a sample of, this, of the cells, of your cells, and we have to look at them under a light microscope in order to see them. So in your book, there's a diagram that shows the relative size of uh, the cells compared to um, us, as well as some cells that we can see, like the chicken and the ostrich egg, frog eggs, we can kind of almost, we probably can see, it says here, naked eye, if you have low big vision, right? A human egg, right? That would be a single cell. But when we talk about bacteria, they are much smaller than the eukaryotic cells, which make up plants and animals. 
So plants and animals are made up of eukaryotic cells, not prokaryotic cells. Okay. So if we look at a bacteria, we're not going to talk a lot about ba bacteria, but they don't have a nucleus, and so their genetic material is just in their um, uh, cytoplasm, the inside of the cell. And they oftentimes also have cell walls that um, are similar to plant cells and to animal cells. So this is a diagram of a bacteria. Okay, so this is the eukaryotic cell. And you'll notice that the internal membranes compartmentalize it. The big one internal membrane that you see there is the nucleus. And so we're gonna talk about the nucleus first. So if I were to like, I draw this in my notes, right? I'd have the outer, this is my eukaryotic cell. This would be the plasma membrane. In my eukaryotic cell, I have a nucleus. And I also have a little inside structure, which is called the nucleolus. So this is my nucleus. And this internal structure is the nucleolus. And then outside the nucleus, but still inside the plasma membrane, is what is referred to as the cytoplasm. And so this is filled with fluid, right? And there's all kinds of other organelles and structures that are in the cytoplasm. So let's look at the nucleus. Okay. So the nucleus contains the genetic material. And so when we look at it, we see these strands, and these strands represent um, DNA that is not condensed into chromosomes. So in the nucleus, okay, this is a um, separated by a membrane with pores. So I'll just put it's a membrane with pores, surrounds or surrounding the genetic material. Okay. So the genetic material, in most instances when the cell is not getting ready to reproduce, is what is referred to as chromatin. So this is loose, uncondensed, DNA plus what are referred to as histone proteins. Okay, so that's the chromatin in here. When we, when the cell gets ready to um, reproduce, the uh, chromatin condenses into chromosomes. So chromosomes are where the DNA is packaged, hence it's condensed, and wrapped tightly around the proteins. So prior to cell division, the chromosomes have to, the DNA has to become packaged. And so you only see chromosomes when in cells that are getting ready to reproduce themselves. Okay. So and you can see a picture of this in your book. Here they show the chromatin, right? It's uncondensed. And then they show the, the DNA molecule being wrapped around these histone proteins, and it can wrap tightly around them, and then you get structures that look like this, which are probably pretty familiar to you. This is what chromosomes look like. So I can show you, a, uh, or I can draw an image of a chromosome. So this would be a chromosome. Right, so this is DNA wrapped around protein. And notice how it's more tightly wrapped in the middle. And so this is what is referred to as the centromere. So this 
So that's why it's got this little tight little pinch area. Is that means that it's more it's more tightly wrapped right there. And this is how the genetic material is going to get pulled apart during cell division. Is we have proteins that are going to attach onto that centromere and pull the chromosomes to opposite ends of the cell. The centromere is um, in the middle at the very ends of the chromosomes. We call this the telomere. So this is a telomere. So telo means end. Think telescope, right? Telo, far away, distant. Okay, it's at the ends of the chromosomes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's telomeres. So the chromosomes you notice have. Some are small, some are large. So these would be the small chromosomes. Does anybody know how many pairs of chromosomes do we have as humans? We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And what that means is, is that we have one set from our father and one set from our mother. So that means that we have a total of 46 chromosomes. Okay, so total 46 chromosomes in our entire, um, in our um, nucleus of our cell, okay? So we're going to talk more about the genetic material later on, but so you just need to know the chromatin chromosomes inside the nucleus. Now, the nucleolus has a different separate function. So it is inside the nucleus. So the nucleolus specifically has DNA that codes for proteins called ribosomes. Can you guys still see that? It's okay to see. Okay. So ribosomes are proteins, and ribosomes have, play a really, really, really super important function in that they are where other proteins are produced. Okay. So ribosomes in the cytoplasm. are the location where other proteins are produced. So they're like protein, pieces of protein factory. Right, so the ribosomes. So we're gonna look more at ribosomes when we get to protein synthesis. But in your book, there is a little picture of a ribosome. So this is um, the two parts of the ribosome right here. This is the genetic information. We'll talk about that, about that what is that's the messenger RNA. These are the two pieces of the protein. And then notice that this is the spot where a new protein is being produced, right? So ribosomes are the sites of protein production. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the and visualize the um, eukaryotic cell as kind of like a factory with different parts or different organelles um, doing different things. And so the first place I want to talk about is the mitochondria. And mitochondria are really interesting um, organelles because they are where ATP is produced. and specifically via aerobic cellular respiration. So what does aerobic mean? Oxygen, so it's with oxygen, okay? So ATP is produced by the mitochondria. 
Now, the amazing thing about mitochondria is, is that they have their own DNA. All right, so they have their own DNA, and they can re reproduce inside the cell. So it's actually believed that the mitochondria were actually separate little organisms like prokaryotic cells that then became incorporated into the larger eukaryotic cell. So we could say that they were once thought to be separate organisms. Okay. Now, do you think you inherit your mitochondria from your mother or from your father? Or from both? What do you guys think? You actually inherit your mit mitochondria from your mother only. And the reason is, is, is that the egg has mitochondria in it. The sperm does not have any mitochondria in the head region. So that when the head of the sperm fertilizes the egg, all of the mitochondria that you get are from your mother. And so we call it kind of a matrilineal um, mode of inheritance because it's just passed out from mother to child um, so that there's no genetic recombination um, occurring in the, in the material between the mother and the father. So we only inherit the mitochondria from the mother. Okay. Okay. So if we look at the diagram of your, of your cell, let's see if I can find it. Okay. These are the little mitochondria, right? Little structures, they're in yellow in this diagram of the cell. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the endoplasmic reticulum, which is another um, organelle. Now, reticulum is a network of membranes, and endo means it's inside of the cytoplasm. So it's inside the cytoplasm and it's like a, a, a network of membranes, okay? So we have two different types of, of endoplasmic reticulum. We have rough and smooth. Oops, I just broke my pen by dropping it. Gonna work, okay. So this is the rough, and we can abbreviate it as ER, okay? This has ribosomes. On, this, on the membrane. This is where proteins that are going to be secreted are produced. So this is proteins to be secreted are produced here. Okay, so that's the rough ER. Now, there's a part of this that is not rough, and it is called the smooth ER. So the smooth ER has no ribosomes. So when we look at it under a special microscope called an electron microscope, it does not look rough. Okay, This is where lipids are produced. It is also where we um, break down toxins. So like if we're talking about a liver cell, the liver cells have lots of smooth ER in them. Okay. And then finally, we have a structure called the Golgi apparatus. So Golgi does not mean anything. This is just the name of the person, okay, Golgi. Apparatus, um, this um, to me always looks like a kind of like a stack of pancakes. They always draw it like that. 
And this is where proteins are packaged. So they're actually modified, we'll put first. Modified and packaged. Right? The other thing that happens in the Golgi apparatus is, is that we produce, it's the production of sugars. Okay, so production of sugars occurs in the Golgi apparatus. Okay, so let's look at your handout that I gave you with the breast milk versus the formula. Okay. Okay, so on the back of that handout, there is a diagram that shows a very specialized cell, which is a mammary gland cell. Now, inside the mammary gland cell, we have the nucleus, right? That is where the genetic material is found, so that the genes that code for everything that's found in protein or that's needed to be, um, or milk, me, milk protein, um, and that need to be turned on in order for milk to be produced are found there. Now, it's important to realize that males also have the ability to produce, potentially to produce milk. They have the genes for milk production. It just never is expressed in them, but they pass those genes on to their female offspring. So, for example, like the genetic material that codes for casein is found in males and females, but only expressed in females, right? So this is the nucleus. Right? Inside the nucleus, we have the DNA, and some of those pieces of DNA code for protein. You'll notice that this um, piece of DNA can come out through those pores in the nucleus membrane, and then they can bind to the ribosomes on, this is the rough ER, right? So that's the rough ER. The red one? Yes, the red one is the rough ER, okay? So they're synthesized, and then notice that they get passed to the Golgi apparatus. And so hence here, let me just turn the light off. This is the Golgi, I can turn the other one. Oops, uh, turn all the lights on. I don't know which one's from where. Okay, so this is my Golgi apparatus. This is my stack of pancakes, right? Notice that it's packaged as the protein, and then the protein, travels right inside the cell and then gets secreted to the outside so all those proteins that we look at antibodies and enzymes and casein they all get produced in this fashion right and they get secreted to the outside so then we also have the smooth er so that would be right here so this is part of the endoplasmic reticulum that has no ribosomes on it but this is what is producing the lipids. Okay. The lipids don't have to go to the Golgi apparatus. They just simply pass through the plasma membrane of the cell and are secreted in that fashion. Okay, So that would be like the triglycerides, that would be like cholesterol, the long chain fatty acids. Those are all produced by the, by, me, by the smooth ER. Okay, And then one that is not on here, is it? It is sugars. Okay, so what is the sugar milk sugar again? What is our milk sugar? Lactose. Okay, so lactose is produced by the Golgi apparatus, right? And so it is released and secreted um, by that particular um, structure. Okay, so this is a specialized cell that has all the other components of a eukaryotic cell. So we only have two more organelles, and then we'll be done with the organelles. Oops, wrong way. Okay. Topic. Okay. Okay, so two more organelles. Lice. Where have you seen that word before? Lice. Lysol, <laughs> hydrolysis, lice. Lice means to break apart. 
So lysosomes are organelles with enzymes. And there's like 40 different enzymes that are found inside of the lysosome. Okay, 40 different enzymes. This is what is responsible for intracellular digestion. So intra means inside the cell. So we, in our stomach, that would be extracellular digestion, but then we have to take in substances and digest them even further inside the cell. And there are some really good examples of intracellular digestion, specifically in um, white blood cells called macrophages. So these are large white blood cells that eat debris. So macrophages eat bacteria and debris, and they clean it up. They're like the garbage men of the body. In fact, one of the really interesting things that I just recently found out is, is that I have this herniated disc in my back that I've had for a long time, but um, it's supposedly over time, it will get smaller. So when you herniate a disc, stuff gets pushed out and, and the white blood cells, the macrophages will actually go into that area and they'll start digesting it and cleaning it up, right? So hopefully, you know, in five or so years, I, that herniation will keep getting smaller and smaller, okay? So this is the way it looks. So this cell, in this case, is engulfing a food particle. It could be a bacteria. It takes it in, and then the lysosome fuses with that food um, space and releases the enzyme and then breaks it down. Okay. Now, there are some genetic diseases that are caused by defects in lysosomal enzymes, and one of them is what is called PKU. And this is short for phenyl, phenyl ketonuria. And you might have seen this phenyl ketonuria before on your food when you're grocery shopping because oftentimes single will say, warning, phenyl, phenyl, phenyl ketonuria, this product contains phenyl alanine. So this is due to a defective Um, lysosomal enzyme that can't break down phenylalanine. Oops, phenyl. Phenylalanine is a type of amino acid. So this is an amino acid. Okay. So this is so common in our population that babies are tested. How are they tested? Does anybody know? Does anybody work with like newborns? Very first thing they do is on the long run, very first thing, but they do it like real close. They prick their heel, right? And they take a blood blood. So when you when the baby is born, they prick the heel and they take a sample of blood. And they're looking for elevated levels of phenylalanine. And the reason for this is, is that if phenylalanine accumulates in the neurons, in the nervous tissue, it will lead to mental retardation or mental de de deficiencies. And it was such a, such a, we'll talk about why, but it's so common in our society for people to have this that when they first discovered it, they went into a lot of the state hospitals and started testing people, and they found out that there were people in there, quite a few of them in there, that actually had PKU. And if they would have removed that from their diet, the phenylalanine from their diet, then they wouldn't have had the mental deficiency that they um, observed in the adults, right? So this can lead to mental, um, the nervous system not um, developing properly. And so you control it with diet. And I think they also have some supplements. OK. 
Okay. There's another um, genetic disease that is also caused by a defect in the lysosomal enzyme, and this is Tay-Sachs. And we'll talk about Tay-Sachs because it's really interesting. It's, not, it's a horrible disease, but it's very interesting from a population point of view because it's more common in certain populations um, than others. Okay, so Tay-Sachs is also that. Okay, finally, peroxisomes. So where have you seen the word peroxide before? Hydrogen. hydrogen peroxide. And so interestingly, our cells use hydrogen peroxide to break down molecules. So remember H2O2, right? That can be broken down, right, to produce oxygen um, and um, it, oxygen and water. I don't have that balanced, but oxygen and water, right? And so this can be used to break down or oxidize different types of chemicals. One that it does that's really important is ethanol. So ethanol is alcohol. Right. So if you drink alcohol, um, the ethanol is broken down. A good portion of it is broken down in the peroxisome. Okay, so it metabolizes alcohol for us. It also breaks down fatty acids, specifically long-chain fatty acids. Okay. And so there is a genetic disease that was actually um, portrayed in a rather famous movie, but you might not have heard of it because it was so long ago now these days. <laughs> but it was called Lorenzo's Oil. Has anybody ever heard of that movie? Yes. Right? So this was a family whose child was um, born with ADL, which is um, adeno dystrophy, you don't need to know that term. But ADL, and um, we'll talk more about that because that is a defect in an enzyme. Um, that cannot break down a specific fatty acids. So this is caused by a defect sorry, in a enzyme that can't break down a fatty acid. And so what happens just like with PKU and Tay-Sachs is this, this long chain fatty acid will start to accumulate in the nervous tissue and it will lead to um, uh, mental disorders and also eventually death. Okay, so very last thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the um, back of that um, other sheet that has the description of the persistent organic pollutants on it. So first, let's see what these what these things are pointing to. So what do you think A is pointing to? Mitochondria. So you can write mitochondria next to A. B is pointing down, is pointing to, um, we haven't talked about that yet, so just ignore B. <laughs> C is a lysosome. What do you think B is? Sacrophagy. The Golgi apparatus. E, that is the smooth ER. I wish I had my glasses. I'm not sure what that is. Nope. Nope. Is that the Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. I can't see the ribosomes. F is the rubiar. And G is pointing to the nucleus. What was A again? A is the mitochondria. 
So you can write down B is the cytoskeleton. So go back and write next to B the cytoskeleton. And we'll talk more about the cytoskeleton, but it is composed of proteins. So what would be the site of cellular respiration and ATP production? What do you think? A, right? The DNA that codes for a protein, specifically collagen, we talked about that as a structural protein within our bones, would be found where? G, right? Because that's the nucleus. All the DNA that codes for the majority of our protein is found in the nucleus. So in the testes, testosterone would be produced where? So what type of molecule is testosterone? Is it a carbohydrate, lipid, protein, or nucleic acid? Nucleic acid? Nope. Lipid, right? It's a steroid. So testosterone is lipid. So where are the lipids produced? Smooth ER. Right, so in the testes, testosterone would be produced in E. Okay. The proteins that are involved in cell moving and changing shape, that would be E. Those are the cytoskeleton. Insulin, a protein to be secreted by pancreas cells, would be produced where? Rut ER. Right? Okay, we just talked about this one. White blood cells, macrophages, ingest bacteria and use this to aid in digestion. Lysosomes, and what number is that? C. Okay. The enzymes produced by the pancreas would be packaged into vesicles by this organelle. Golgi, right? So the Golgi apparatus packages proteins that are secreted. Okay. And then um, I don't see the secreted protein, so just mark off that one. Please mark out that one. And then sugars are produced where? Golgi apparatus or Golgi body. So that'd be D. Oh, glycogen is broken down into glucose in this organ now. Um, Shoot, I think that's a lysosome. Let me see. Intracellular digestion. Okay. So I'm going to record another lecture that is specifically going to deal with the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane and how things move into and out of the cell. So I'm going to record that tomorrow afternoon. And I will have it posted. Your next quiz is um, next Thursday, and it is going to be over the organic molecules, and it's going to be over cells and then the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's what the next quiz is going to be. Cells, plasma membrane, organic molecules. Okay, have a good rest of your day. Lab notebooks are going to turn in Tuesday. Yeah, so the lab notebooks are going to be turned in on Tuesday. Not your binder, just your lab notebook. This stuff, um, or is there, um, stuff like that. Yes. Um, can I keep that in there? Oh, yeah. oh, this is your lab notebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just happen to keep it in there just for now. But when okay. I turned it in, do I just take you can take it out? And yeah. The worksheets and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because then I'll make it easier. So I handed this out in lecture. So if you could keep that with your lecture notes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So whatever we do in lecture, just what we have in lab is what I would do. Because otherwise I'm looking through notes and I have all of your right. notes and you don't so want me to have them. Yeah, and you don't want me to have them while you're trying to study for the quiz. Yeah. Um, I missed um, one more because I went to
I want to take it and sell my LRP course on my campus. Like, this disappeared every time I go to take it. Okay. It just goes away. Contacted Bruce House. He's the person. What's your name? Samantha Mills. Okay. I left a little comment on it for you. Okay, so I can um, contact him. Or do you have access to it now? Yeah, it okay. just popped up today. <laughs> okay, so I'll let you know. I'll see if I can open it back up for you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The E, that's a, uh, either a food, that's a, either a vacuum or a lysosome. What are the what are the choices? I'm assuming that's what like, I could just pull it back up after I oh. But it was like so it was three. Oh, you can't see yeah. it. Oh, yeah. It was those three. It's green. Well, and those. Like mitochondria, yeah. that's a Golgi apparatus. That's a smooth ER. That would be the rough ER, but they don't have that label. Yeah, centrioles. I'm not sure what that is. I'll look it up. Okay. <laughs> Maybe she was trying to uh, designate that as a chloroplast. Well, that's plant. So I think it's probably green, so it's a chloroplast. That's what I put. It, or we read it wrong. Okay. Okay. So anything that says lab. I can put in here, right? Yes. Okay. And I would recommend maybe getting a three ring here because by the end of it, these are going to be falling out. Oh, instead of a. Yeah. So I can have regular sheets on? Yeah. The three ring? Mm -hmm. okay. So if you get a three ring binder, then you can put these in and your regular sheets. Have you written a lot on a separate piece of paper yet? No, just this, but my. my what is it? The, the binder check that you mm -hmm. have? I have a regular binder. That, so you, that's another one now? Yes. Okay. Otherwise, that stuff is just going to start to fall out. Okay, so that's why it's all free. Yes. All right. Whoever it is. You don't want me having it for a week while you need to study for a quiz. I have a. It's probably the students.